We're going to dive into our message today. Would you turn to Acts chapter 1, verse 1? Acts is a book in the Bible, and it's Acts as in actions. And this is a book about the beginnings of the church. The church, not just this church, but the church, capital C, the big church. And we're excited about this series. And uh, one thing I just want to ask while you're, while you're turning there in your Bible is, have you ever been in a holding pattern? Have you ever felt like in life you were in a holding pattern? You know what a holding pattern is? That's where the airplane, they won't let them land. And so they're just circling around and around the airport. They have to stay close. They have to stay within that airspace, but they can't go anywhere. They can't land anywhere. They're in a holding pattern, and it just feels like they're making no progress. I know you and I are not an airplane. We are persons. And so you're not in that kind of a holding pattern. But like, for example, have you ever been on hold with a doctor's office? I think my wife, Shelly, has spent uh, like about a third of last week on hold. Like she's doing other stuff. She's cooking. She's, you know, uh, working on her lunch hour. Like for literally hours, she's been on hold. That is a holding pattern. Or uh, maybe you've applied for a job and you just need to hear back. Are you going to get that job or are you not? And it's just all you hear is, you know what that is? Crickets. Cricket, it's just like it's, you just hear the bugs outside because there's no, nothing coming back from the hiring person. Or maybe you're, you're waiting for a mortgage broker to get back to you. You're waiting, 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 giving them all the information and going nowhere. You're in a holding pattern. Or maybe you're waiting to hear from the college dean of admissions. And it's, this is one of the biggest decisions of your life. You're just waiting. Oh, I just need to hear one way or the other, was I accepted? Or maybe you're waiting for test results. Lab results. That's, that's not a very fun wait. And while you're waiting, it just seems like time stands still. Waiting is so hard when you don't see progress. Well, in our series, Great Beginnings, it, it was a beginning that seemed like it took a long time to get there. And it, I'm thinking about when God's only son, Jesus, came to earth. He, he was the Messiah, the anointed one, the promised one that was supposed to come to Israel and save the world. And he fulfilled so many prophecies where he was born and how he ministered and, and how people treated him. All those things were the subject of predictions through God speaking through prophets way in advance. And people were excited, wow, Jesus is here. Is, is he the Messiah? He's fulfilled so many prophecies. But then he gets to the end of his life on earth gave his life on the cross, then rose again, and everyone's confused. Is, is he the Messiah? Is he not? When he rose again, they're like, oh, okay, that seems like that's, that's probably a biggie. <laughs> and, but then they said, but we thought Messiah was going to do this, this, and this for Israel and for the kingdom. So there was some question. Like, Jesus, are you going to set up that kingdom of God or not? What, what, are, what are you doing? And so during the time that Jesus, right after he died and rose again, there was a lot going on. And I want to read a little bit of that story in Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 1. In my first book, I told you, Theophilus. Okay, so, whoa. Okay, what are we talking about here? This is the, this is the book, The Actions or The Acts of the Apostles. Is written by Luke, and he is saying, hey, you remember the gospel of Luke, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke, that was his first book. This is just volume two of the same book. So he says, in my first book, I told you, Theophilus, it's Theophilus means lover of God. And there's there's some debate. Is is, Is he just writing to all lovers of God or a specific person? We believe he was writing to a specific person. Uh, in, in Luke, when he, he starts out, he says, Oh, most excellent Theophilus. That's like saying uh, your governorship or your honor. It's, it's, it was, a, it was a, a title of like military standing or governmental standing that he used for him. Now it's interesting, in volume two, he doesn't give the title. And so I'm kind of wondering if Theophilus put his faith in Jesus as a result of Luke, uh, the book of Luke, the story of Jesus. And now we don't have to call him, oh, exalted Theophilus. We can just say, hey, Theo, 
You remember that first book I wrote? I want to tell you the rest of the story. Pretty cool. So this is the beginning of Acts. In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. So the Gospel of Luke just told everything Jesus taught, did, the miracles, the teaching, going to the temple when he was 12 and, and dialoguing with the, the professors and, and everybody as a 12-year-old. Luke told about all that stuff. And he's reminding us, hey, I told you about all that stuff. And uh, all the way up until Jesus uh, was taken up to heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. So he's reminding us, I told you about that gospel, everything he did, up until that point where after Jesus died and rose again, we saw him taken up into heaven. The disciples saw him taken up into heaven on a cloud. Okay, verse 3. During the 40 days after Jesus suffered and died... He appeared to the apostles from time to time, so the 12 apostles, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. Why is that important? Because they're following Jesus. They'd given up their lives to follow Jesus, and all of a sudden, he was dead. And so then that made him question everything. Well, is he the Messiah? Was he? We thought he was God's son, and now he's dead. He died on a cross, but then he arose again. And so Luke is saying, hey, Jesus kept stopping by to say, hey, guys, I'm alive. It's really me. Touch, touch the wound in my side. Touch, the, touch the, the wounds on my hands. It's me. And in fact, one of the things I love about Jesus, he was always asking for food. After he died and rose again, he was like, you got anything to eat here? You got any cake? You got any fish? You got any bread? And Jesus was always eating with them. And I think he was trying to show them, I am really alive. I'm alive. I have risen from the dead. And so uh, in the beginning of Acts, he says, man, in many different ways, he proved that he was alive. And we know from other places in the Bible, he, uh, he appeared, there, there are about 11 recorded appearances of Jesus after he rose again. One of those times was to 500 people at one time. Paul was writing about it, and he said, don't believe me. Many of them are still alive. Just go ask them. There, it's not like there, you know, Jesus and one person who may or may not be lying. You know, it's 500 people saw him at once. Go ask some of them, Paul said. Jesus is alive. Yeah. He is alive. Praise the Lord. Yeah. So in, that four, in the 40 days right after he w- was uh, crucified and then rose again, in that 40 days he proved in many ways he's alive, and he talked to them about the kingdom of God. The disciples, every time they were together, they're like, okay, okay, here's the food, here's the food, but tell us, what about the kingdom of God? Is, is this the time that you're going you're gonna to restore Israel to the days of King David and King Solomon? When are you going to make, uh, make it so that Rome, the Roman Empire, is no longer over us, telling us what to do and occupying our country? Jesus, when are you going to make the kingdom come? When are you going to rise up, put on that crown, strap on that sword, and lead an army? That's what they were picturing was the kingdom of God. And Jesus began to teach them, you guys, this is a two-phase operation. So when Jesus came, he came as the suffering servant. And it was prophesied. Isaiah especially had chapters about him coming, the Messiah coming as the one who would die and give his life and be beaten and rejected. But Jesus was letting them know there is another, that thing you're picturing is going to happen. And Messiah is going to come back physically on this earth and rule and reign, king of the world, the real one, not this one. I am the king of the world, not that one, the real king of the world, and reign for a thousand years. And then that's just the next prophetic thing, and then other stuff happens after that. So Jesus was teaching them about the kingdom. Now, in John chapter 20, verses 21 to 22, is, it gives us a little bit more information about Jesus, one of Jesus' first meetings with the disciples on Easter. We call it Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day, that day that Jesus rose from the dead. He met with his disciples. He just shows up. Whoop, he's in the room with them, in the locked room. He's there asking for some food. And again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me to the earth on mission, 
As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he did the weirdest, coolest thing. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And I believe that this was the time that the disciples actually got converted. They actually got saved. Their faith had been in Jesus, but he had not yet paid for their sins on the cross. Now he has paid for their sins. The sacrifice has been made. Their faith is, uh, uh, is combined with God's power and the Holy Spirit coming into them, and they are converted. They are changed. They are no longer who they were. And we see they get busy. They get with it as God is changing them. Uh, Jesus, the, the, the Holy Spirit has come into them. They're made new. They're regenerated. We talked about that last week. They are, they are made new. They are born again. And it's interesting, Jesus said, I am sending you just like I was sent. But in this case, they were sent but told to stay. That's weird. That's kind of interesting. Jesus just said, I'm sending you like I, like I was. Jesus, the ultimate missionary, came from heaven to earth. He said, I'm sending you all as missionaries too. But by the way, don't leave. That's, that's kind of interesting. They, uh, God put them into a holding pattern for their own good. Jesus had given them lots of truth. He'd been teaching them about the kingdom and the two-phase thing, suffering servant now, returning king later. He had been teaching them all this truth, but truth without power doesn't do much in this world. And Jesus doesn't send you out without power. And so he said, you need to hold on. He told the disciples, you need to wait for the promise of the Father. So back in Acts chapter 1, continuing it on with the passage I read earlier, verse 4 once, when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so this is a while into, I, I don't know if this is day 35, day 40, I don't, I, it wouldn't be day 40. It's, it's somewhere in this period of time after Jesus rose from the dead. And he's teaching them, and he says, you guys, stay here. I know you're missionaries, but don't leave yet. Stay here until you have received the promise of the Father. And in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, he gives us a little bit more detail about that night. And this is what Jesus said, and now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised. Oh, interesting. There's the Trinity right there. So Jesus says, I, there's the Son, will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised. God is three in one, not three gods, one God in three persons. Interesting. And Jesus says, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Okay, they don't know how long they're going to be there. They just know they have, they're supposed to just wait. Well, could, could it be, would it be three years? Would it be 10 years? Would it be 100 years? Would it be 25 years? Like Abraham and Sarah waited one time? Like they, they don't even know. They just know they're in a holding pattern. Don't go anywhere until you receive this Holy Spirit. Now, they had received the Holy Spirit. When Jesus breathed on them, he said, receive the Holy Spirit. But this same Jesus said after that experience, but there's more. The, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you, and you're going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Like, like we baptized in water recently, and water got all over the people. The Holy Spirit gets all over a person in baptism with the Holy Spirit. So they had received the Spirit, but Jesus said, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And he just said, you just got to wait. But if you're waiting on a promise from God, I just want to encourage you with this. It's worth it. If God has given you a promise of blessing or a promise of leading or a promise of calling, and he's given you that promise, trust me, it's worth the wait. Even if it takes a long time, it's worth the wait. If, if you're waiting on a promise from the Father, it's a promise. It is going to happen. You, you, don't have to, you don't have to wonder. All we don't know is when and how. But if God has given you a promise, it is going to happen. If you're waiting on a promise, you also must receive it then from God. So Jesus is saying, 
you got to get yourselves in a, a waiting pattern. You're going to need to wait. And when we wait on the Lord, we are waiting with intentionality, with, with longing, with prayer, with seeking God. You, gotta, you, you, you need to receive it from God. You, Jesus, in other words, was saying you can't just receive, you can't create this power that you need to go be my ministers and go on mission. You can't create that yourself. You need to receive it from God. So wait. The Father is going to make good on his promise. And if you are waiting on God, that implies a time of testing. Your faith is tested in the wait. But the good news is, when your faith is tested, it gets stronger. It grows. It's actually a good thing for you when your faith is tested in waiting. God will use it for your good. So what I'm trying to get at in this message is that when God says wait, it's for your good. When God says wait, it's for your good. He's not being mean. He's not punishing you. He's working something in you. He's growing you. And it will be worth the wait if God has given you a promise of blessing. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, uh, it's such an encouraging verse. It says, but those who trust, that word means trust, wait, hope. Those who trust, wait, hope in the Lord will find new strength. It is a promise of God. They will soar high on wings like eagles, it says. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. It is a promise of God. And so I want to ask you, are there any promises from God that you're waiting on? Is there anything, any a dream that you feel like God's given you, a vision? Maybe God's given you a word, a prophetic word, or uh, maybe he made a scripture just stand out to you and you knew God was speaking that to you, but you haven't seen it come to pass yet? I was thinking through some of the promises in just in the word of God to us. By his stripes, you are healed. That is a promise of God, but maybe you're waiting for that to be realized in your life. You believe that promise, you know that promise is for you, but you're not, you, don't, you haven't seen that healing yet. Here's another promise I love. Overwhelming victory is yours through Jesus Christ, our Lord. But maybe you're not, seeing that yet. Maybe you're, you, you don't sense victory yet. Maybe it feels like defeat right now. But I'm telling you, if that's God's promise, and it is, it's in his word, then that promise is for you, and that promise will come one way or the other. Here's another promise. Call on the name of the Lord, and you and your household will be saved. And in that day, household meant extended family. Grandmas, grandpas, brothers, sisters, nephews, nieces, your family. That, that's a Bible promise. Call, you call on the name of the Lord and you and your household will be saved. But maybe, maybe they're not all saved yet. Maybe you're still waiting. Here's another promise. God will give you abundant, generous wisdom if you ask and don't doubt. That's a promise in the book of James. But maybe you're still confused. Maybe you're waiting for that promise of wisdom. Jesus said, I came to give you a rich and satisfying life. And maybe your life doesn't feel that rich or satisfying yet. But it's your promise that you're waiting on God for. Or, or maybe the actual one that Jesus is talking about. Maybe you're waiting to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And this is the promise of the Father for you, for every believer but maybe, you're, maybe you have not experienced that baptism yet and you're waiting. Maybe God gave you a dream or a vision or a word or uh, may, maybe you just felt like God spoke to you. You're going to start a ministry. You're, you're going to start a business or you're going to get married or you're going to have a child, but you haven't seen those things come to pass yet. I want you to know, and I just want to encourage you with this today. When God says, wait, it's for your good. Our missionary guest today, Brent, told me that 
there, there were times, there were other times in their lives they thought they were going to step out and be, become a missionary at that point. But for whatever reason, God closed the door or turned them a different way at, at each of those times. And I suspect that you're beginning to see, looking back, oh, I'm glad he did. Because now I have experience in this, and now I have experience in this, and, and that other thing. God, if, God, if you're waiting on a promise, it's for your good. And that is good news. But waiting sometimes feels different in different stages of life. Man, if you're young, and I'll let you define what young is. But if you're young, waiting is torture. I want to do it right now. I don't need more experience. I don't need more funding. I don't need nothing. I just want to do it right now. It's very hard to wait when you're young. And you might even be tempted to make things happen in your own flesh instead of receiving it from God. Abraham and Sarah did that in the Bible. God gave them a promise and they went, whoa, a whole bad left turn that, that changed, that impacted the, the Middle East and the world for centuries because they made one bad decision getting out of God's plan. They needed to wait just a little bit longer. It wasn't the time yet. When you're middle-aged, that age of, of raising kids and getting them off to college and raising them when they're young, getting them to preschool, that whole age of middle age, you're, you're so busy that it might just feel like, I don't have time for a calling right now. I don't have time for that dream. I just got to do what I'm doing every day. My nose is down. I'm just like, I'm in the thing. I'm in the thick of things. When you're elderly, it can sometimes feel like, oh my goodness, time is running out. If I, if I don't do this thing quickly, I might not ever get to. And there can be a, almost a feeling of panic or anxiety come in like, uh, I have this dream for ministry or for this or for that, and I haven't seen it happen yet. Uh, is it going to? Do, what do I need to do? Do I need to lay it down? Do I need to like work harder? Well, uh, it, can, it can be very anxiety producing. So what do you do in any season of life? You wait on the Lord. I just want to sing that just simple song. Let, would you stand and would you sing it with us? Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. He will renew your strength. So wait, I'll stay. Wait on the Lord. keeps your promises. You are the God who never fails. You are the God who is love. And I'm wondering if there are some of you that you know specifically you are waiting. You are waiting for a promise. You are waiting for that word to come true. You're waiting for that ministry to start. You're waiting for that spouse. You're waiting, whatever it is you're waiting for. If you are in a holding pattern and you're waiting, would you just raise your hand? I just want to pray for you very specifically. Many of us feel like that. Waiting on a healing. Waiting on a home. Waiting on a, a career choice. Waiting, waiting, waiting. Lord, you see our hands. And Lord God, we lift them up to you. That's the whole purpose of raising our hands. We're raising that thing to you. Lord, we surrender that dream. Lord, we surrender that, that Bible promise, Lord God. We surrender that, that desire of our heart. We surrender it all to you, Lord God. And Lord, right now we say, I trust you. 
I trust you. Lord, if you are, have us waiting, it's for our good because you are good. You are good. You are good. And you are all powerful. You could snap your fingers and it would be done right now. But you have chosen not to for our good. Lord, we're not giving up on that dream unless you say to. But what we are going to do is trust you. We're going to hope in you. We're going to wait on you. Just like we're going to read about in days to come in Acts, they waited by praying. They gathered and they just prayed every day. And they did not give up until they received that promise. And so, Lord, we're not going to give up on prayer. We're, we're going to double our efforts. We're going to gather some friends and family. We're going to pray. We're going to seek your face. And we're going to, we're going to keep praying until that answer comes. Because we believe in you. We believe you're good. We believe you're for us and not against us. We believe we are healed. We believe overwhelming victory is ours. We believe we have all the wisdom we need. We believe. We believe it, Lord. And you are the source. We trust you. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. Let's stay in an attitude of prayer. And I want to just invite you one more invitation. I want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus if you have not done that. There's nothing you could do to save yourself, and we are all sinners in need of a Savior. Nothing you could do to save yourself. You can't create that regeneration, but God can. How do you put your faith in Jesus? Turn from your sins, turn your life over to Jesus, to God, and let him lead. Would you like to do that today? Maybe if you're online or in the room, it doesn't matter. Or even if you're watching this, this service later, I want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus. That is so important. And that changes everything after that. With your head still bowed, if you want to put your faith in Jesus today, you want to become a Christian today, maybe you're coming back to Christ, or maybe for the first time you're putting your faith in Him, will change your destiny forever. You go from heading to the hot place to heading to heaven. That's amazing. That's an amazing transformation. If you want to put your faith in Jesus today, would you raise your hand if you're in the room and that will tell me I should pray for you. Yep, I see some hands going up and that is awesome. Online, I can't see you back, but God can see you. Would you raise your hands to God? And everybody, would you pray this prayer after me? Let me just coach you in a prayer. But you don't say it to me. Say it to Jesus. Let's go. Jesus, I invite you into my life. I acknowledge I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin. And make me new. Give me new birth. I want to be born again. In Jesus' name. And I choose to follow you starting now. So lead me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer today, we say welcome to the kingdom of God. Welcome to the family of God. And would you just let me know, if you, if you made that decision today, would you just let me know, fill out a Connect card, check the box at the bottom that tells me that you made that decision, drop it in the offering, uh, offering, offering box. It helps so much just to tell someone that you made this step of faith. And I, I, I'm just so excited for you. God is going to do big things in your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Garen. Wow, I, lo I love just that phrase, when you wait, when God tells you to wait, it's always for your good. It's never for your bad. He's never trying to hurt you. It's always for your good. Amen? Amen. All right. It's so good to see you this week. Hey, if you joined us online, would you just hit that subscribe button? All that does is help other people find our channel so they can hear about Jesus. And if you join us in person and you're newer, please drop in that connect card into the, um, the offering bin just so we can connect with you. It was good to see you all. I'll see you all next week. And if we could just have a couple guys stay after or gals. Again, inclusive. We're just going to set up the room for um, Together Nights. Talk to Jerry about that. God bless.